Okay, this is a piece that I feel I feel is worth doing every year because a it's number one it has to do with the Haggadah and what everyone else Klai Yisrael does. Two, because it has to do also with uh, understanding what the Gula was all about. I've made references before in the past. We spoke a little bit about it last week. But uh, it's Kedai to see inside the Leshem itself because it's, it flies in the face of what people have known for years about the Gula, about why it left Mitzrayim so quickly. And the third reason, because, because it, is, it is so opposite to what people think. And it's an it's a example, you know, very you know, we spoke about before, but it's an example of, of how misconceptions can, can actually develop and then grow in Kalei Yisrael until it becomes a whole philosophy, how we're looking at life, and it's wrong. It's simply wrong and, uh, and misleading. So this kind of like sets the record straight to, to a large degree, and then there's what to learn in terms of how it uh, affects, affects the present-day situation as it stands. So, just starting from the first paragraph over here, Vahine, this is the Leshem. From uh, it's actually from Jushi Ulamatohu. It's an Ashari lesson because somebody collected together different sections of Ashkrafa from different le- Sfarim of the lesson. The lesson is extremely Kabbalistic with parts that are more Hashkafic, you know, and somebody from a Mot that is very, very uh, an expert at obviously the lesson, maybe all of the lesson, the Sifi lesson. And uh, he was able to pull out the sections of Ashkafa that aren't you know, necessarily so Kabbalistic, but uh, are important to know, and that they that they basically uh, that they that they they uh, he organize them according to topic, so that we can learn them according to topic, right? So he says the following thing. He says, "Vihinei." I'm just going to share. Vihinei. Zehu omek kavana mash amar. No, I think the Hebrew maybe is also this too. Right? The Pasik says, talking with the Jewish people leaving Mitzrayim, in this week's Parsha, that uh, the Egyptians, they finally threw them out, just like God promised Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe came back in the end of Pasha Shmos and says, you know, he said, you know, what did you send me for? Fine. So he didn't listen, like you said, but to make the slavery worse, and Hashem said, not only Will you, you know, you go out in the end, but they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna push you out. They're gonna throw you out. They're gonna want you to go so badly and so fast that you won't even have time to prepare any, uh, anything to eat for along the way, right? So that's what the passage says. It seems that there's, there's a big kasha. There's a big question over here. The ki harayira mitzrayim az lisakev sham od eiza shoaz anshi echinu lehemzer laderech. Right, that uh, that they were not able to stay behind, even to prepare, you know, even a little bit for the, you know, to, for along the way, the provisions. Right, so we know the Jewish people had to leave Egypt quickly, very, you know, very, very, very quickly. Three million Jews, three million Arab rums, a lot of people to push out. And I uh, once had Madrash that Moshe was busy at the last minute collecting, you know. Candies and mum for the children, which have what to eat along the way. Right? It's always good advice for parents by the way to make sure the kids have what to eat, keep them busy. Right? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? You know, we just left the garage. But uh, the uh, you know, and and it was it was you know they it's a lot to prepare. I mean, it's a big question because they knew they were going out. I mean, you know, how long does it take to make provisions? It's a whole matzik question. You know, how long does it take to make matzah? Right? The problem with matzah is not is not you know having enough time. The problem with matzah is having too much time. 18 minutes unworked, right? You've got this water and flour together, unworked for 18 minutes, it becomes chomets, right? And they certainly had 18 minutes to make chomets. Okay, not angel's bread, you know, Berman's bread, but, uh, but certainly chomets, you know, the gum. And uh, that's a question unto itself, uh, which raises the issue, right? This is always the question, the, the historical question. Do we eat matzah because there wasn't enough time to bake bread on the way out? Or was there not enough time to bake to bake to, to bring, you know, to break bread, to bake, to bake bread on the way out because we had these matzah. Now, what was the cause? Right? Was the was the cause not enough time, and therefore matzah was incidental? I know the answer. I know you know the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Or did we have to eat matzah? So therefore, Kosh Baruch Hu pushed us out to make sure there wasn't enough time to bake bread. Right? Obvious, but that's not the way people look at it. No, but, but it's well, your, your question is not the answer is not one of one of your two choices. though. The answer is not one of my two choices. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. 
But uh, and the, and the point is, is that it's not the way people understand it. It's not the way the, you know, the Haggadah is taught. It's not the way Hashkafa is taught. It's not the way the story is taught. The Chumash doesn't really go into any detail. It just says with the we had to leave quickly because, uh, as the Gemara learns out, that uh, just like uh, you know, when it comes to mitzvahs and matzos, the same way that you know, matzos, you have to work quickly, otherwise you lose the opportunity to make matzah, it becomes chumas. Likewise, when it comes to mitzvahs, you have to go quickly. You have to do it quickly. You have to you know, bechit bezon, not, not linger, because everybody knows if you put off a mitzvah, something invariably will happen to you in the course of your day that will prevent you from doing that mitzvah. You know, it's just like, you know, forget. You know, you'll, 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 have a, you'll have a distraction. You know, some other event that will occur. So you, you must, mitzvahs come to your hand. You do mitzvahs as soon as possible because that's the way we show how much we value Torah and, and schar in the world to come. So anyhow, but that's the reason why we left so quickly, because, as the Forsham explained, and most people understand, because the Jewish people were, were, were teetering on the brink of spiritual disaster, holding on Memtesh Shaituma right towards the end, the 49th level of spiritual impurity, had they stayed one second longer, right? A few minutes longer, an hour longer, they would have gone over the edge, the Nun Shaituma, and there'd be nothing to talk to anymore, and to save the Jewish people. I mean, this is very, this is very medical. How do you, how do you measure? Like Moshe had a stopwatch or a stop hourglass, basically that allowed him to figure out the sundown. I mean, obviously, you know, Kish Baruch could help him out, but how do you know how much too much time? And second of all, what about the last guy? The first guy gets out right away, but there's three million people leaving. Right, it's a whole trail of people. What about the last guy? He like falls from the Shari Tuma. the first ones got out safely, but the last ones oh stay too long in the end. All because of the slow pokes in the front of the line. Uh, he's like, you know, how does this work? What's that supposed to mean? So, yes. The Rav spoke several weeks ago, and, and I remember you said that the Memtet Shari Tuma, that was the Messias at the beginning of the Makos. Well, wait, wait let's, let's, let's okay. go through this piece. That's what, this is the Makor. Okay. This is it. This is the reason we're going through right now. Okay. There, I just referred to it here and see it inside. Okay. So that's what he says, okay? So now comes the Kasha. He says, in according in my humble opinion, we cannot say this. We cannot say the reason why the Jewish people are so quickly and had no, no time to prepare, you know, pre- prepare for the way and make provisions was because of the fact that we were teetering on the brink of spiritual disaster, holding, literally looking over the edge, the precipice of, of Nun Shari Tuma, because that's not possible. Why is it not possible? Right? Hariyad Rabba, right? It's just the opposite. Hu Shnisbatel as we're forgetting one very important fact over here. And that is every makkeh, every plague that took, that, took, that took place in Mitzrayim was another, it was just a makkeh, it wasn't just like a, you know, another event taking place historically where, you know, you know the, the, the milk truck showed up and now the angel's truck showed up, you know, and this thing showed up. I mean, I learned in the summertime, I go in, in, into to, uh, the basement early, so I, I look outside because the air is so nice. And I sit facing the McCullough and I see all the trucks one of the after the five o'clock and five thirty and they like literally like clockwork. It's amazing because it's a small parking lot, so they make sure they don't block the parking lot to the other guys. So it's like one event after the other event, right? That's a side story. The point over here is that it's not just another event. Every and it's not just another market, not just another plague. Every plague is an increasing of the light of of God in the world. So therefore, if that's the case, we have a claw. Where where Kedusha stands, Tuma cannot stand, and vice versa. So if the light's increasing and getting and getting brighter and brighter and more intense, by definition, the Tuma has to become weaker in strength. So if God's presence is becoming more more pronounced in Mitzrayim, then by definition, the presence of Tuma and impurity and Suham and all these various different names we have for spiritual impurity and power of the Egyptians in general, they have to be getting weaker. By definition, that's the way it works. So therefore, if that's the case, we're holding now by the tenth plague. God Himself is performing the death of the firstborn, not an evil osaraf, an evil malach, not a me and nobody else. I am the one who's now taking care of the death of the firstborn across, across Egypt. And uh, if that's the case, the the gilu, the revelation of the light of God is so intense that by definition, the koyich of tuma of evil has to be like literally almost bottle, almost gone completely. So, that's what he says, right? Right, this is the passage from this week's Parsha, right? As it says that not even a dog wagged its tongue at, at uh, or barked you know, at the Jewish people. And it's, it's just, everything was still and quiet and peaceful 
and the dog here represents, you know, like Tuma to some degree. But even to that extent, Kosh Bochu had the entire environment under control for the sake of preparing for the redemption. The dogs got rewarded for this later on. The Gemara says they got, they got, you know, one of the things you can do with Novela, which is basically meat that was shechted improperly, is that you can feed it to a dog, right? That's part of the rewards for having been quiet and not wagging their tongues, the Jewish people, on the way out, right? They waved goodbye, but they didn't wag their tongues, right? Now, Ray, as a shvatim belehehem, as the pasuk says, I will, uh, I will, I will do judgment on their gods. Barak es bacharehem and kill their firstborn. Veim kain ayeh hayim makom as l'shlus a tumma chas v'sham. That's the case. So how can you say there's any place for tumma to have any in any strength, any say in the matter of yitzis mitzrayim? V'lo shaych advarim lamar ela rak al sof shibudan v'tchil skula son. Right. The only way you could that, like, but it's a vor. Everyone speaks about this. So is it completely false? Right? Are we passing around a completely false piece of Torah over here? No. He says that's true. There was a time when the Jewish people were holding a mem teshari tum and the brink of spiritual disaster, but that was before Makkah's dub. Mm. That was at the end of the Shibu. If it could, it was, it's 191 years early. Because Baruch Hu had not stepped into history. It was supposed to happen. We were supposed to be there for, for, for 400 years, right? But we weren't. Right, we 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 we, uh, we 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 left we left early, right. So if if, if we had continued on the four hundred years, so then we would have been destroyed because spiritually we would have assimilated completely. So if a Kodesh had not stepped in at that time, if Makkah them and began the plagues and said Moshe Ben down to Mitzrayim, so then we would have kept going and assimilated and become completely lost amongst the Egyptians. But once that happened at the beginning of Gula. Everything is now a gilui. Kibayim shol ha yed chibat chil ha gula klal ha yu ha'ad avadim u'misraim. I don't know how God that was true, but it says if if the if the gula had not begun when it had begun, so that we'd still be slaves to, to par misraim. Azmo yelohem to kana to kana v'chas v'sham, and then there would be no rectification whatsoever for the Jewish people. Ki nikta suba memtes madregas hatuma because they already entered the completion of the forty nine levels of, uh, of of spiritual impurity. Kedis Galal, Midrei Zohar, like it says in Zohar Kachadosh, Reish Parshas Yisro, source, 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 lots of sources over here, right, uh, all the way down, 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 to, I can add another brackets, Kedosh Yisro, in Edios, in the Mesach to Edios, in the Gemara, so Perch Beis, Mishpat and Mitzrim, Yud Beis Chodesh, the actual judgment, the plagues, took place over the course of 12 months, the Chei Beis Edor Olam Per Gimel, he named me Azare Machil Yiriz Asam. The moment that the plagues began, that was the going down of the Sitra Achra. We call the Sam short form, right? Some the Sama Khalaf. Uh actually here's Sitra Achra, not Samach now. But the Sitra Achra, right? So that he goes down Mishlita Sa from his power, from his his uh, his uh, his control. The Yada mi Azla Hala, the Yarida Ach Yarida. <clears throat> Every plague is going down, 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 getting weaker, weaker, weaker. Before after the Pascha Shibud, right, and after the after the Shibud actually ended, that's the, for sure when he went down, which was when from Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, right. So the plague began in Nisan by Rosh Hashanah. The Sitra Achra was basically battle, was basically canceled out, was basically weak at that point, as it says in the in the Medrash of Magam B'Chodesh Nisan B'Leil Rishon Shapesa, and, and how much more so in the month of Nisan the following year. On the first night of Pace of Shahisa called Sitra Acha Kufufa, or Kavusha, right? By the time that the Leil Seder, by the time they made the first Seder Mitzrayim, the Sitra Achra, right, the Satan, whatever you want to call him, Malachamavis, he was Kafufa, he was, he was bent, he was like, he literally, like, you know, like a you know, broken, broken uh, reality. And Kavusha Achia Omen is Batella Gemerat, right? So, so he was literally in the verge of destruction. If anybody was in the verge of destruction on Leil Seder, at the time that the Jewish people were preparing to go to Mitzrayim the next morning, it was the Sitra Achra. He was in trouble. Not the Jewish people. The Jewish people were perfectly fine. They had a great time. They were making the, you know, the ones that survived Makas Choshev, the ones that died. Makas Choshev, 12 million Jews, but the one fifth that remained, the three million that remained, so they were perfectly you know, stable and spiritually in the, you know, you know, capable and, and powerful. And that's why, <coughs> who goes looking for whom? In the middle of the night in his pajamas. Not Moshe and Aaron, right? They're making, they're doing Korban Pesach. They're having their, their Seder. Paro has to wake up in the middle of the night, unlike kings who usually sleep until the morning, three hours on the next day, the next morning, and he's still wearing his pajamas because he lost his firstborn, and now he's worried about himself because he's also a firstborn. 
looking for Moshe and Aaron to tell them, finally, get out, just go, go, let's, let's leave this place already. So that's clearly indicating the situation at that time was that the Jewish people were strong, Kedushi was strong, and Tumen was weak. It's amazing. That's right in the Parsha. That's not even, that's not Sod. That's not even the Gemara. It's not even Drush. That's right there in the Parsha. Why don't we see that? Why don't we pick up on that? Why don't people discuss that at the Haggadah, the Seder table? Why is it not a major issue with the Jewish people? Why doesn't someone say, hey, wait a second. I've been taught up until now that the reason why we left so quickly <coughs> we eat matzah is because we left Bechit because, because the Jewish people were holding Memphis. You know, the, whole, the whole story. And now I'm finding, yeah, that doesn't make sense to me, doesn't it? It makes sense to you? But not to me, right? So, so what, what's this Masora? What's this tradition? What, what, what really happened over here? It changes the whole story. So as a side point, he just brings in over here, the Gam Be'ikra Dvarim Be'inin Shar Hanun. Right, since we're talking anyhow about the Nun Shari Tuma, the 50 gates of spiritual impurity, Hinei Hagam Shizkir also Gam Kim Ramak, let's also mention the Ramak Zab a Sefer, or so it's mentioned in Sefer Pardis Shar, uh, Shar, uh, Shar HaSharim, Perak Aluv, Amnam, so the, so the, the Ramak, but Moshe Kodavera is holding that there is Nun Shari Tuma, the fifty gates of, of Tuma. However, the Gra, Zal and Mishle, Ted Zayin, Pasuk Dalit, the Pasuk Kol Pa'al Hashem Lanehu, all the Kosh Bochu does, he does for himself. Amar Sham Kila, said, Ruachre Enu Rak Mem Tes Shari Tuma. The Gra Hel, there's only 49 gates of spiritual impurity, not 50, for Sharon Nun, Ain Lo, but he doesn't have a 50th. That's a, that's a, mis, a misunderstanding. We only have 49. 49 is bad enough. Don't worry, it's not a huge enough community between 49 and 50. You get to 49, the end of 49, basically almost at 15. But you can't have 50 itself. There's no 50. Why not? He explains, right? If a person then fulfills, you know, gets to the full extent of the 49th level, so then I've already the person's gone from the world. He's not going to be able to do tshuva or come back. He's just totally lost. He's like, just literally, there's nothing you can say to this person. To bring them back, nothing can happen to change their way of thinking. They're just always going to be seeing it the wrong way. He says uh, so that's bad enough. Asher Amarnu you Avadin the If the Jewish people remain slaves to the uh, to Paro and not the Gula had not begun, so there would be there be no Takana because they would have gone to Memtesher Tuma and that would have been the worst. They would have been they would have been destroyed. Because they got to the 40th level, and that's where they remained. Had they fulfilled that, that 49th level completely, they would have been destroyed completely. However, right, what comes out of this thing? There's no 50th level of impurity for the Sitra Akra at all. And even the they fulfilled the 49th level, is not really possible. A person is not going to, because, because basically the person is already lost. Halfway through on the way to 49, it's already bad enough the person get, you know, get cut off from the Jewish people from history at that point in time. We a shy little gun, look at this guy in clock, because at the 40th level, the person cannot survive at all, spiritually. Right? I'm not going to, Lashem says, <coughs> how do you like, how do you deal with the, the difference of opinion over here? There is a nun, there's not a nun, right? The Ramak says yes, the Gras says no. What's, what's the answer between these two great, these two great Kabbalists? So he says, I'm not going to do that right now, but it seems to be that the prevalent opinion is that the Gras, like the Gras says, that there is not a Mem Tesh Shari Tum, there's not a 40th level, I mean, not a 50th level, only 49. Because of Kush Baruch Hu, <coughs> usually makes everything corresponding to the other thing. As whatever you create on Kedusha, there's usually a corresponding element on the side of impurity. It's a balance, and, you know, good versus evil. They have to be balanced out. So there's a, it's a corresponding reality on both sides of the line. But that is only until the 49th level. Let me just turn off the ringer. The uh, the the hammer mentions about panim tahar, right? As we see, because the Gemara mentions in in the in the Medrash, there are forty nine faces of 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 tahara and forty nine faces of tuma. So you see, forty nine is like the cutoff point, not fifty at that point. Kemoshe of a Medrash the hill means more yud base siman dalid become mokamas aval sharanun hinei hu bechinas ain't soft, but nun 
in Kedusha is Orin Sof. And that's the source of everything. You know, good, bad, it's all, it's all comes with Orin Sof. So that you cannot have a balance, you can't have a counter to that, because that's like, that's like, that's, that's the essence of Avodah Zorah. Avodah Zorah is believed, there's, there's, Shtei Rishio, there's two sources of life, two sources of light in this world, that, that just like the Kedusha is a source of life, that's a Kosh Baruch Hu, or in Sof, likewise, does Tum have its own source? No, not true. Kosh Baruch Hu feeds everything. The Kedusha feeds both the Kedusha and the Tumah, both sides of the other line, so therefore there's no Nun Sheri Tumah, because that would be too high up. Uh, ahu, ahu, rach, ad, I'm not going to say that right. Like a bunch of badgers to hell, but the badgers of Rashad Nun, he nay who bechinet to the rows. Also, that's the point. Okay, that's the point. The main point over here is that there's no, there's no Nun, there's no level Nun, there's no 50th level by Tuma. Okay, that was just a side point. Because since we're talking anyhow about the, the Nun Shari Tuma, uh, you know, it's important to know whether it even exists. The Nachs of the Indian, going back to the original point, Tigam Ladasa Meforshim, Shiesh Nushar Hanun. Even for those who hold that there is a 50th gate of impurity, the Sidrachra, Gam can. That's fine. That's, that's a Machlokis, but you hold that, whatever, right? However, Gam can Hine Eev Shardo Marsh, Zeho Kavana Mamet, Masha Kazavalo, Yachluz Mamea, right? But even according to them, you can't say that that you know the shot that the reason why there was no time to, to delay and make provisions was because of the fact that the Jewish people were holding on the brink of the you know the memtesh nun whatever you hold in the end that's not possible. They would hold that we shouldn't fall to the level of nun. Because. As we're saying, by the night of the Seder, by the night of Makis Bechoris, there was no room, no time anymore at this point in time to, you know, for the Sitrach to have any strength. Tuma was on the way out completely. The Jewish people were, were, were they left again Ramah with an exalted head. The Jewish people were way up there. Whatever problems we had previously were all eliminated. They were all wiped away. We're no longer on the verge of being destroyed spiritually and therefore being lost physically at the same time. So then what, so we're still stuck with the question. So why do we why do we leave so quickly? It's the problem. Right? That that is that's part of the halacha. Right? El Hakavanahu This is the Khirish. This is like this is like I may remember the first time I saw this, it just totally blew me away because I, I'd never heard this before. And there's some things you hear when you think you understand something, and it turns out it's a little bit different than what you thought. Right, you know, there's some things, you know, you know. I remember, you know, in my early, early years of learning Gemara with my Chirusa, we would like learn that this whole sugi of Gemara, and think, oh, we got it right, going to Shir, and hear differently, and then go back and say, how do we think? You know, otherwise, it wasn't we were completely wrong. We made a few mistakes along the way. It's you know, we're, it's like the general direction of where we had to go, but we weren't exactly precise in the conclusion we got to in the end. And after hearing this, you know, straightened out, things made more sense. But there's sometimes, you know, in life, you find out that it's exactly the opposite. Completely, what you th- you thought, and not only is it the opposite; it's it's more than somebody. Oh, wow, that's amazing! I never thought that before. That's interesting. That's like changes the way I look. Now, this is a point that's so fundamental that I can you go go so far as to say this misunderstanding is the reason we're still in exile today. That's how far it goes. This misunderstand. Where's this coming from? <clears throat> well, let's just finish the paragraph. We'll come back in a second, right? Because at this time, is he's revealing his light to the Jewish people in Mitzrayim. It's a big, huge revelation. The Haggad itself says it. The Haggad itself says We should be asking this question. Are we paying attention? Are we like focusing more on the Charosis or more on the Haggad? Right? Are we thinking end of Seder? Right? Usually what happens to me by the first, second glass of water. I can drink one all year round. For some reason, because you're, because you're probably hungry, tired, it's late, you're cleaning all that. The second coast of wine, basically, boom, it just gets me. You know, and it's like, I'm like struggling to stay with it now. You know, and I got to fight. Maybe I have a second wind at some point in time. I'm thinking meal. Thinking meal. She's like, you know, like, you know, let's get past this part. You know, I got, I got to go to sleep for like double nights. It's like, whatever. It's like, eh. and you don't pay attention. You're just like, oh, the next part, next part. So later on, Baruch Hashem, you know, you, you get back into the game, and once your kids get older, they demand 
to get back into the game and make it more interesting and, and make it more, uh, so yeah, you know. But are we paying attention to what's being said? The Haggadah itself says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu revealed his light to the Jewish people. He himself did this, you know, this, this, this nace, this maka, this magate, this play, what took place. At this point in time, the Chachamim at the table should be saying, wait a second. We're being told the whole reason we left early was because we're about to go down to Nun Tuma, and now you're telling me that that night God revealed himself to the Jewish people? Where does it happen? Does God, can God reveal himself in Ben Yehudas or Dizengas Street or someplace even worse, you know, in Amsterdam? Where does God reveal himself? To people who are fitting, in a place that's fitting. He's not going to reveal himself in a bathroom, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a makam of Tuma or a dirty alleyway, but in a shul, in a base madras, you know, in our Sinai. That's where he reveals himself. That we should be asking the question right in the Haggadah. Wait a second. God himself, you know, the, this is not this is not so, this is not Kabbalah. This is not the Zohar. This is the Haggadah, written for families and everybody and children. Someone should say at this point in time, you should be asking this question to your kids. This is a question, you know. I mean, the person asked my, my kids this question, they're like, yeah, right, good point, good point. You know, it's like, yeah, well, yeah. And it changed the whole conversation. And changed the whole discussion, and changes all of history. For that matter, I can't emphasize this point. Of, you know, this is so much revolves around this particular answer coming up. These next two lines, you know, so much. Just like, for example, the Medrash says that all that happened to Yosef will happen to Zion. A very short statement. It goes through a list of what happened to Yosef, what happened to Zion. What's the, you know, what's the connection? Well, the gematria of Yosef and Zion is the same thing. One fifty-six. But the, the Medrash is telling you something. You want to save yourself a lot of akmas nefesh in the future. You wanna you wanna you wanna like you know expedite the redemption and not make the the galus last longer than it than it actually did. Go back to the story of Yosef and learn what they did wrong over there and not make the same mistake. Not make the same mistake, because you know something, we're making the exact same mistake. You know, and not just that, but as as the result points out, this is a little bit kabbalistic, but it's an important point. When Yosef says maragli matem, he calls his brothers spies. The reason also is because he's warning them. He's telling them, if you don't rectify the problem you're making, the mistake you're making now, you will come back later on as Gilgulim in the bodies of the actual spies, not actual Gilgulim born into them, we call Ibo, you can come and go in the course of a person's lifetime, and you will, you will make the same mistake all over again. Whatever you made with me will happen there. And we did. We did exactly that. And Sion is the name used for the Jewish people at the end of history, in advance of redemption, and then into redemption. So the Magic says that all that happened to Yosef will happen to Sion, but what happened to Yosef? Uh -huh. Well, you know, they, they totally misjudged him. They, they thought he was a crook. They thought he was a bad guy. They thought he was like you know, negative for the Jews. They thought there's no way in the world God wants this guy, and God cherishes this guy, and his dreams are, are sharp. They can't be anything, you know, you know Worthwhile because look at the guy, he's curling his hair, he's you now it's gonna be a So we, let's sell this person, even though our father <coughs> will be so so badly affected by it, but we're justified because clearly, clearly, clearly this guy needs to go. And lo and behold, a few parshas later, Anios and they can't talk. He's his dreams are fulfilled. God sent him, God wanted him, and they're all like, I cannot believe I'm so wrong about history. Not just wrong about Yosef. But about a history about God, Ashkach Pratis, they're totally blown off their feet completely. So you say to yourself, well, we know, where could that happen again? You know, where we know, like, all that happened to Yosef will happen to Tzia, which means basically, and don't forget who these brothers were, they, were, they would make us look like, you know, not such religious Jews. They were, they were stark. They were the sons of Yaakov, the grandsons of Yitzchak, and the great grandsons of Avon they were living in a time that Kushbroch's Baruch presence was much more felt than today. For them, Yerushkei was not theoretical, it was Lamaisa, very Lamaisa. They, they, were, they were powerful people, the Shifteka, the fathers of who we are today, right? And they couldn't see past Yosef's external appearance until much later on when he finally reveals himself. So what about Sion? <laughs> Take a look around. Just look at the way the Jewish people, especially religious Jews, relate to Israel. In the, the diaspora. Baruch Hashem here in Israel, they're here. The, the ones that are here, appreciate it. They're here for that reason. But in the diaspora, the fight you have to go through to, to open people's minds that this 
is the gula. It's all part of the gula process. This is the last time. It's not another thousand years coming up or five hundred years. Another galus coming up and coming back another time. This is the beginning. This is it. Want to be part of the, the part of the end of the show? This is it. Ah, oh, the camp. The camp. There's no way. The, the camp because you know because you know the, you know this because the Zionists start the whole thing and secular Jews are involved and you know it's, you know American money and you know etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It can't be. Well, look at the, look at Shai Gilguli. We talked about how God works through backdoor means. If we're not going to work through front door means at the end, because why? For the same reason, God had to work through backdoor means. Yosef could have gone down to Mitzrayim, could have become king without going through the whole story he went through. Why did he go through the whole story? Because we just weren't with the pay, with the, the program. We weren't with it. So Gush Baruch Hu worked through backdoor. We forced Hashem to work through backdoor means. So that's exactly the same thing. One statement that tells you. How to save yourself at the end of history? One step, one answer. Lechem, Eilu Hayunis got akfu od rega echad b'Mitzrayim. Had the Jewish people stayed one more moment in Mitzrayim, Hayam is bato kol has to achra kula mikovakol. What would have been destroyed? What was at stake? The Jewish people stayed one more moment in Egypt. What was at stake? The Jewish people's future? No, they were sailing. Yad Rama, they're at the top of the world. They controlled everything. They had their revenge. They had their, you know, they got even to watch the revenge in the end, or at least know about it. Through, you know, eleven o'clock news, they got to see a, a, a summary of what went on that day. You know, and, and they're watching this. This happening, right? So who's on the verge of destruction? The Sitra Achra, evil, Tuma, spiritual impurity. If we stayed one more second, what, what, what are we talking about? We eat matzah on Leil Seder. Because we left quickly to save the Sitra Achra, to save the site of Tuma. That's why we, we're eating matzah because of him, because he, he was about to die in the end. Yeah. Oh, wait a second. That like throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing over here and changes my whole, whole Haggad. Like, Sitra Achra, he's the enemy. He's the bad guy. We want him to be destroyed. We want him out of the picture. Isn't that what your Muslim Mashiach is all about? Isn't that the, the end of the days? Finally, we, now we're going to kill. The Sitra Acher, God himself, will shecht him, he'll be gone, and there'll be no need to harm whatsoever. Isn't that the ideal? Absolutely, but not there. Why not there? We'll see in a second. Right? He says, that was the problem. That changes everything. Because, had that been, if we bought for the Sitra Acher, if he canceled and destroyed the Sitra Acher completely, then that would have resulted in the destruction of the Yitzhahara too. Wow, great. And that's, I could do without my Yitzhahara. You know, you know, then I could do everything right. And all these temptations wouldn't bother me anymore. Spend all my time doing the right thing. Yeah, but of course you get no no schar for that. Once there's no Yisahara, there's no free will. That's what he says. V'lo hayim b'kom b'chira klau, and that's the whole point. L'kach lo yechlulus v'meya, and that's why the Jewish people could not delay a moment in Mitzrayim because had they stayed a little bit longer, the Sitra Achra would have been battle. And then the Yitzhahara would have been bato, and then free will would have been bato, canceled out. And he's going to say right now, and that's the whole point of creation is free will. And that's what the Pasuk says. Look at the Torah itself. This is a Chiddush. Pay attention to the verses. Just look back to the Torah now. This is beautiful because, you know, are we going out on a limb? No. Go back to the Chumash and read the verse. What does it say? Right? The Chazek Mitzrayim Ava Am Lameher, the Shacham in the the Egyptians themselves, they had to push the Jewish people out. Ki amru, kulana mesi, all of us are dying. <coughs> they, they were almost destroyed. So therefore the Jewish people had to be pushed out from Egypt quickly. The whole reason to leave quickly was to leave room for the, for the Yitzhahar to survive, that evil should exist. So that free will could exist. And that's the reason for my separations. That's the whole reason why. That changes everything. It changes the whole story, the whole picture. Right? It does, you know, the flow completely the opposite of what's supposed to be. So the question becomes, what's, you know, what's, what's shot over here? This is exactly what history is supposed to be leading towards. Right? We're supposed to be leading up to the Muslim Mashiach, at this, and that's, it's all going to happen like that. So what's the difference? So Lashem says there's one thing and one thing only. It was one choice that had to be made. Not a bunch of choices. Lots of Bechira, you know. Adam Rish had one choice. Right, just one choice. But there's one choice they did not make, and it all came down to this one choice. And what was that? In the entire process, going back 
to the beginning of the Makkah, 12 months earlier, <clears throat> before that for sure, right? Even after that, even in the Midbar, because they want to go back to Mitzrayim, there's one choice they failed to make, and that was they never chose redemption for themselves. Mm-hmm. They never decided it's what they want. They never said, God, please redeem us. We've been here for so long and we're losing it. Spiritually, we're losing it. Physically, we're losing it. Just do, you know, please already, you promised something of Yitzchak and Yaakov, you bring a redemption, you know, for me. Please now, early, whatever, whatever we have to do, you know, we're not, we, we, we merit it, we don't merit it, but, but please, whatever, we daven for the gula. It's a peace the issue. We're anticipating the redemption. Just please, just bring it. Just, we, we want it, we want it. They never did that. Never. It was just basically, <clears throat> it was imposed upon them. Because Baruch came in and he stepped in after a hunt after two hundred nine years because if he didn't, the Jewish people would have disappeared. There'd be nothing to redeem. There was a promise to Abraham and then to Yitzchak and to Yaakov. I will redeem the fourth generation, bring them to bring them there as Canaan that had to be fulfilled. So therefore, Gosh Baruch said, "You're not worthy. I'll do it anyhow." He brought the mockers, brought the plagues to, to end the slavery to make the point that hopefully at some point in time that maybe the Jewish people say, "We've woken up. We've seen the light." Right? We know what's going on. We made a mistake. Oh yeah, redemption. We forgot all about that thing because we were enslaved for so long and before that we were doing so well in Goshen. You know, it's like, yeah, and f- we remember, yeah, there's a promise to Abraham and the promise to Yitzchak and Yaakov to us. And, 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 and yeah, right. Oh, okay, thank God we were woken up and you now please, now the redemption. No. Didn't do it. Didn't wake up. Didn't see the point. Just sat back and watched the whole thing happen. You know, what's going to happen next? To the extent that four fifths not only didn't choose the redemption, they chose against the redemption. They became enemies of the redemption. They rejected it. The whole con- they actually rejected not that like you know they doubted it. They rejected it. They chose to stay behind. Remarkable thing. The one fifth they rejected, but they also didn't choose it either. And the proof was the first time they struggled in the midbar. Let's go back there as as right. <laughs> okay, fine. There's no Egyptians anymore, you know, just to speak of. There's no slavery, you know. But let's go back to Mitzrayim. No, I, I took you out of Eretz Mitzrayim to bring you to Eretz Canaan to be your God. Eretz Canaan, Eretz Israel. That's where you have to end up. Eretz Tzvaz Chalavad Vash, the Holy Land. You've got to be there eventually. The one fifth never chose it. So God kept trying to build them up with more miracles and and and, and, and Torah. We see now, you know, before that creates Yamsu, but the air of Rav got in the way. If the air of had not gone out with Moshe Bain and the Jewish people, under at Har Sinai, we would have chosen the redemption and gone to Israel, but there pleased him, 11 days later, entered the land, conquered the land, and that would have been the Muslim Mashiach, and Moshe would have been him. Moshe would have been the one to be the Mashiach for the Jewish people at that stage of history. Instead, we did the air of, you know, you know, confused everything, they go Zahab, and we never made the choice. And history has been going on now for thousands of years. Thousands of years for this one choice that we never made. It's one choice. Hashem says that you followed me in the desert, and it seems like He's giving us credit for that. Yeah. But, but are, are we? But he's still, being nice. He's being nice. He's being nice. Okay. Yeah. You follow the desert, and you fetch the entire mm-hmm. way. Okay. Every whenever you see that pasuk, we see yeah, that like, right. that wonderful too. Right. What goes in the back of your mind? Right, there was the Eagle Zahab, there was the Maragli, there was this thing, there was plenty about the clothing. He's like, he's like, you know, oh, okay, well, you want you want to talk nicely about us right now? It's like you go someplace and they talk nicely about somebody, you know, a whole kind of, you know, you know, it's like it's all going through your mind, but okay, you know, you know, quiet in the meantime. Now, there's a schus, there's no question, there was a certain amount of bit of but it's almost like Kushporhu is stretching for it. The pasuk is like, it's like, it's like focusing on one side of the story, maybe it's talking about the women. The women, you know, they were the Shem the entire way, they followed him. So that goes back to the uh, the Russian explains. It goes back to the chet of Eitzadas Tovarah. They weren't as affected by the Eitzadas Tovarah the same way that the men were. And so as a result of that, they weren't involved in the golden calf. They weren't involved in the Maraglim. They were more of the Cheshav versus Israel, more practical. Being there's all kinds of different answers for why that's that, that's the case. But but uh, it's, it's more like Dalach Hashchus because the reality is you open the Chumash. I mean, on one hand, they do point out there's like only like eleven averes, eleven major averes in the course of forty years. The Torah is focusing on the negative part, just like the, the Nevoah focuses on the negative part. But the reality is, is that there was a lot of good and a lot of good people in there as well. But, you know, from the Moragli Mongol, I mean, you know, for the next 40 years, basically almost everyone's dying off between the age of 20 and 60. All the men are involved in this, this generation. No one survived but Kalim Yeshua. Mm-hmm. 
in the end, and that's pretty bad. So maybe it's talking about the first two years when he first left, just walking into the desert at the beginning to get the Harsina, the one fifth of the left, basically the four fifths that didn't even leave. Right? It's not it's not a pretty picture. Amen. But the emphasis, the point is, <clears throat> this can't be emphasized enough. The matzah sitting on the seder table. What's it doing there? What's it doing there? Uh, we dress up like kings and queens, you know, you know, the best cutlery that we have, the best plates and like that, or the best kosher Pesach plates and cutlery we have, basically, you know, and or the best plastic we have, what I guess, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, you know, whatever you know, you know, situation. But yeah, dressed up, the kids of the whole thing. It's a, it's a festive evening. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderfully festive evening. There's no question about that. But the matzah sits there, you know, in the middle of the, the table, and it's like poor man's bread. Commemorating the fact that the Jewish people were once holding a memte shaituma, and had we not left quickly, we would have gone down to noon. So basically, the matzah is a reminder of how grateful we should be to Hashem. He stepped and saved us from Mitzrayim at the last second, which is true. And it is that, that type of reminder. But it's really more musa. It's actually kind of a slap across the face, to a large degree. Because at the point of the matzah, the whole reason we have matzah is because we left quickly. And the whole reason we left quickly is because we had to give light to the Sitra Akhra so that Bechir could remain. And the whole reason why Bechir had to remain because we didn't make the choice to leave Mitzrayim, to leave Godless and yearn for redemption, like we're supposed to yearn for redemption, then the Master is basically saying, you are here making a Seder in exile, whether you're here in Chutzlart, or whether you're here in Israel, still exile, we're all in Galus together, because there's different levels of Galus, we're less Galus in Israel in Chutzlart, but still Galus. Mashiach hasn't revealed himself yet, no, I didn't say didn't come, but he didn't reveal himself yet, right, and we're still kind of like struggling a little bit over here to get the act together, you know, it's getting more intense in the world against the Jewish people, and with Iran, and financial, it's like, it's like, it's not, not yet your Muslim Mashiach. We haven't crossed that threshold completely yet. We're on the threshold, we haven't crossed it yet. And, and why? Because, because you didn't make that choice. That's what the Matzah is saying. The Matzah is saying to you on the say, is that, like, what, you're still here? What, you, you still, you're still like a Seder? In Galus? What, the, the, the Mashiach didn't come this year? Last year, the year before that? You, you guys still haven't made that choice? I remember way back at the beginning, 3,323 years ago, when, when, you know, the first time you were leaving and you didn't make that choice, and, we, and you had baked me in order to eat me to remind yourselves of the choice you didn't make. And you're 3,000, you know, you're still making matzahs after all this time to remind you of the choice, and you still haven't made that choice yet? <sighs> Here comes the war of Gog and Magog. Yeah, you, know, you wake up finally, you make, the, you, you make that choice, right? In the Shoah, right, in the Holocaust, a lot of people make that choice. It's just unfortunate the choice was made at the time and no longer made a difference anymore. A lot of people spoke about Mashiach, that maybe this was the end of history. Just like, for example, when the, when the Twin Towers were hit, people changed their mind, they changed their way of thinking. People spoke about World War III, Armageddon, why 2K also began that process a little bit, right? But the World Trade Center, like, people thought that's it, and then it's, you know, it was a disaster. I mean, it was terrible. And it really affected people all around the world. And, and not just you know, financially and physically, but just psychologically. And people were thinking to themselves, this, this could be it. We didn't make the choice yet, but we opened our mind. In the Holocaust, people were just hoping that maybe this was leading to better times. So it did, but not as good as better times as, as it ought to have, because we still didn't make that choice. And that's, that's what it's all about. That's what this guru is all about. Because Baruch Hu, Parsha Shmos, Parsha Ve'era, Parsha Bo, Parsha B'Shalach, all the way through. Right now we're in Shavavim, the light's building up from Parsha Shmos. It peaks a little bit by Tu B'Shvat. It gets to its, its climax, you know, by Pesach, by Purim, and finally by Pesach. It's a, it's a whole ghoul of process, this entire period of time, every year, all year round. But specifically this period of time in Shavavim, right? This Parsha Shavavim stands for Shmos, Ve'era, Bo, B'Shalach, Yisro, and 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 Mishpatim. and some had Truma and T- and Tetzavadin as well. But but it's these parshiyot, it's not incidental. They're they're there to help us and to educate us for this period of time. And why is it? That's one choice. It's one choice. People are not boicher the gula. So David Melech says, "Atat hakum terchein tziyon ki eis lechene ki vamoed kodesh baruch you get up and you will help tziyon at the end, right?" And 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 you because the, the, the time to show her favor will finally come. The appointed time, 
will come. The Gula, right? The Gula is coming, right? Zion is the name the Nevi'im used the Jewish people in the process of going to the final Gula. And what does it depend upon? Ki ratzu avdech as avneha because your servants, they, they want her stones and cherish her dust. It's not just about loving the land of Israel. That's certainly a major part of it. That's certainly a major, major part of it. But it's, we love Israel because of what it represents. It represents the Gula. That's what it represents. It, even in the people's minds who don't live here and don't want to leave her right now, what does Israel represent in their minds? Right? What do people tell you, religious people, people who believe in Torah, when are they going to come? Terry Israel, when Mashiach comes. So therefore, it's Israel, Mashiach, what is the same idea? They're all part of the same package. So let me show you something interesting. You know, there's a little you know, a side point, but it's also a very important point. Imagine somebody standing on a cliff over here, and there's like a big, big valley in between. And there's another side of the cliff, you know, over there, like the Grand Canyon. You know, it's like you know, two, two sides. Of the, and uh, he's camped over here with a bunch of friends, right? And he's looking across the side with his binoculars or with his eyes, whatever. And, he sees over, it look, and the grass looks greener on the other side. It looks greener, right? So he's talking, you know, he, he wants to go over there. And he says to his friends, boy, I'd love to get on the other side over there. But they don't want to go because, you know, they're together here. They don't want to go. They're all stuck on this one side. He says, I, I'd love to go over there. It looks, looks so beautiful, right? So they don't worry about it because there's no bridge. There's no way to get there. He can't fly. You know, he's not going to swing across and tie his, his rope to. So he's stuck. He, as, as much as he wants to talk about it, and he can. Maybe it's annoying, but he can talk about it. But it's not going to. It's not going to 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 threaten them, because there's no way to get there. He's stuck on this one side. So Mashiach, you know, Ben David, you notice we can talk about all we want, all we want. No one stops us. Not even the Sitra Acher. The Sitra Achra says, you want to have a sheep in David? Go ahead. You know why? Because there's no bridge. What's the bridge? The bridge is Mashiach ben Yosef. That's the bridge. Mashiach ben Yosef bridges us from the time we're living in right now to over there. So the Gra talks about it every generation. There's, of course, the Mashiach ben Yosef, potentially the Mashiach ben David, you know, and who the word in different generations. But he's the key. You'll notice how little is spoken about Mashiach ben Yosef in history. <clears throat> There's one safer that I'm aware of that actually goes into detail about, <clears throat> and I always wonder about it, who is Mashiach ben Yosef and what does he do with, you know, he comes from Yosef, he's like Yosef, it's not Panera, you know, but it can run, like, you know, you know the, the, the Tachlis. Who is he? What's he supposed to do? You know, and what, what function does he fulfill? And how do you recognize him? And who might he possibly be? There's like one reference to Mashiach ben Yosef by allusion, pretty much, in the Gemara, <coughs> in Sukkot, it's almost left out completely. As if it doesn't matter. As if it doesn't even exist. The Sfarim, no one talks about him. He's, he's an anomaly. He's like a mystery in the end. There's one safe from aware that actually talks about him in detail. And it has to be one of the most controversial Sfarim in the Jewish library. That safe is called Kolotor. Kolotor which Rav Chaim Friedlander writes a little, you know, a scum introduction to the Sefer, another Gedolim, basically. It was a manuscript written by the Talmudim of the Gra, who got their information, supposedly from the Gra himself, about, about Yishu Eretz Yisrael, returning to the land and rebuilding the Yishu. The Sefer was not really actually written up to many years later, based upon manuscripts, and therefore it was extremely controversial that the Gra really say these things. Because you don't find these things said so specifically in other Sefer Gra. Not to mention the fact that people like Rav Chaim Balaj never, never, never speak about these things. One of the, you know, the main Talmud of, of the of the Gra. Fine. So you know, different people and different organizations have spent the time to verify that the Sefer itself is authentic. It came from the Gra. Doesn't make a difference. No one wants to learn it except for the people who are. It sounds very Zioni. That's really what the bottom line is. It sounds you know more like you know religious Zionists and maybe perhaps even some secular Zionists. So therefore, the religious world backs off from the Sefer. Okay, and it, 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 therefore most people don't even know about it. Now, you have to ask the question: What's going on with Yosef and his brothers? What's happening over here? I mean, these are these are the shift taker. These are the, the the tribe of God, not even of Kel, but of UK, right? These are people who are extreme. We're told we're not supposed to compare ourselves to them. We're not supposed to try to understand them too much because you know you understand something. You're always comparing to things, you know, to yourself, what your experiences are. And these people are up, up there. That's why we look at it. 
We're almost untouchable. Not as much as Yaakov and Yitzchak and Avram, but, but still, very untouchable. And yet you open the Chumash, and there it says, they had Sina and they had Kina. Two basic emotions that the rest of us are told we have to try to control. The Raisa Mitzvah, not to hate your brother in your heart. So then what's the difference? Well, you know, for them, it's much more of a, of a Torah issue, and they were much more of a Shem Shemaim, and <clears throat> we read into the whole story different things about what might be behind what they did. And we even blame Yosef a bit because he was doing things, you know, not exactly right, and some say we can't, can't blame Yosef because Yosef is really at Sardik, so he made Hashem Shem Shemaim, but there's ways to do it. There's really, you know, there was a whole you know, pill pull of Torah, you know, around the whole story. But the bottom line is, is, that, is that it's a big, big, big question mark in Jewish history. How can ten brothers get together and sell another brother without talking to their father first into slavery and go through this whole process and then be so wrong? Because the Kodesh Baruch Hu gives it to them about good. The shock they go through all the, episode, the entire episode, they, get, they pay for it in the end royally and they lose their power. They lose their streets and they lose their cover and then because of it. Okay, you imagine who becomes the king and all they know about the end of the Goliath. What's behind all of that? What's behind all of that? Why Dafka Yosef as opposed to another brother? Because that's the Sitcha Achra tax. He'll always attack the key. Right? The reason why you can talk about Mashiach bin David all you want is because without Mashiach bin Yosef, you're not going to get to him. The Sitcha Achra can afford to let you talk about Mashiach bin David because he knows you can't do anything about it. And that's why he hasn't come yet. You know why he hasn't come yet? Because we're so fixed and fixed on Mashiach bin David, we totally forget about Mashiach bin Yosef, whatever that might possibly be. We're so outside the, the, the loop in terms of Mashiach bin Yosef that basically the Sitra Akhra has no problem with this. But try and get into the Indian of Mashiach bin Yosef, where you actually facilitate the things that the Grah points out, Kibbutz Galius, getting involved in trying to you know, ingather the exiles from around the world. It's a very big Mashiach bin Yosef thing. <clears throat> the rebuilding of Eretz Israel, because that's what Yosef loves the land, right? And the, and the Yishu and the developments that Grah pushed his students to look at the names of the streets, you know, Rivlin and you know, all these, you know. You know, you know, Mishkalov, yeah, right here, right, right here. So all, you know, these are Tommy Negro who began the issue in times of a tremendous sakana, tremendous danger, right? And Megal is Sod Ba'olam, right? To reveal Sod, secrets of Torah, of, of Kosh Prochus Hashkacha, in the world because Yosef is the Bechina at Tzavnes Paneach, as Paral points out, he's a revealer of hidden things, <clears throat> it says the Gra, anybody who's involved in these three things basically ha- is working and functioning in the level of Mashiach ben Yosef. But boy, you better watch out. Once you do that, because you become a target. A target big time, because you are a facilitator of redemption. And that means the end of the Sitra Achra. And that's where we get lost all the time. Back in Mitzrayim, with the Maragli, historically, and today especially. We're sitting here waiting for Mashiach ben David to come. For 3,000 years, we've been waiting for Mashiach ben David to come. We can't understand what's going on. We learn Torah, we learn, we do mitzvahs, we build Bata Midrash, we build Bata Kaneos, we do all, so much right in the end. And we wait. How long can we wait for? I mean, everybody at some point in time, if you're waiting for your flight, or you're waiting for a bus, and one after that, they go by, they go by, they go by, and an hour later, they're still going by, and your boss says, you give up after a while. You, that's human nature. What do you want from the Klai Yisrael? They didn't choose. We chose. We won, right? The essence of Mashiach ben Yosef, the essence of it, this is a chiddush. It's a major chiddush, right? But it's, you, hear, you, think, you know, think about it, it rings so true. The essence of Mashiach ben Yosef is making that choice. Choosing Geula. Making it, I want the geula now. I don't, it doesn't make a difference. I've made a killing in the stock market. I got a wonderful house, you know, in whatever community. And I'm so, in the, you know, I don't care. All for the side. Who am I? I'm Christ, I'm a Jew. I'm part of the, you know, the national people who, who, who dream of the geula in the face of Mikdash and the Shechina. That's who we're at. That's what, that's what we're about. That's what we're all about in the end. That's, you know, I want that. Whatever I'm, that's what I want. To be in Israel, with the nation together, in the son of the world. When a person makes that decision, when a person that becomes their priority. That's the way they think. No matter how much they're enjoying the exile, how good it's been to them, they don't accept it. They just dream and they make the choice. The person is functioning in the level 
of Mashiach ben Yosef. And believe me, once you do that, you talk about it. I know somebody who's in a community in the, in the States, right? You know, and uh, he basically takes my material and shares it with the community. You know, and, and more and more people are coming on site. And the rabbi of the community got wind of this stuff and stood up in the pulp and blasted everybody. Mm-hmm. Blast everybody. You know, they don't to go. It's not the time. It's not important, you know. Literally say that where we are is where we have to be. And fortunately, enough people could see through it. Right? There's a job mistake over here. You know, there's a misunderstanding about what the priorities are. And I think more. I think more than likely, he lost. You know, the people lost respect for him because people could. This. I mean, even if it's true, someone wants to get up and say, "Look, folks, I don't know whether you can go, whether you can't go. It's great what you're doing. The cheshik, that yearning. That's who we're about. Right? The said, that's what we're about. That that's wonderful. And keep working with it." But be well, be practical. You know, think about it. You know, ask yourself, can I can I make this decision right now? But good, keep keep going. You're in for it. And if it turns out the whole community moves there to Israel and they lose my job, fine. That's the way it goes. That's that's what Claudius Israel is all about. I can't put my job before the priorities and long-term national goals of Claudius Israel. But did the of the Gula for three thousand years? That's one decision. Because Baruch Hu has been waiting for the Jewish people is to make I want. I want Gula, I want redemption. That you function in the capacity of Mashiach and Yosef, you can bridge the gap of Mashiach and David. Because if we don't make the decision, and this is the most important part of all, we never learn in Jewish history. We just never learn. What happens to the Jewish people if they don't make the choice? Because life is too good. Because Boch just takes it all away. You get, you get to a point where you say, now I want the Gula. Because both of now you want the gula. When you have the chance to make that choice, it's not a choice when you're sitting in a concentration camp. It's not a choice when being chased by the enemy. It's not a choice when you bring down the base of meat. That's late. Who wouldn't want it now? It's a choice when you're sitting in Galus and it's going well. And you're succeeding. That's when you show if you're attached to the goals of Kalei Israel, or you're not. If you're just a from Jew living in Galus but cut off from, from the history of Kalei Israel, or part of that history, even today. So the Haggadah says, every Jew has to look at himself as if he too left Mitzrayim. Because you know why? We've been leaving it for 3,000 years now. We just never quite got that second foot out. One foot, but not the second foot. It's just keep slapping it along. Slapping it along. Eventually we have to leave, we have no choice. The question is, will we be part of the four-fifths? They don't make it. Or the one fifth that does, and and will that one fifth look like it's supposed to look this time, or like the one that got, you know, died off in the desert? Tough decision, but the bottom line is that's what every Jew has to do, and everything else will revolve around that.